Okay. You're on the Six Screens Telenetwork, earning the reputation of giving all the right ingredients, uninhibited, and exposing the hard, cold facts about the Watchtower Society. And no, we're in Disney. Well, hello everyone and welcome in. I'm going to call this the premiere program of the night. Friends, you're looking around the world. You're seeing things are changing. If you're living in America or maybe you're living in the UK or wherever you are, is this the same world that you grew up in? Well, we have a man tonight. He's going to come on here tonight and explain to us all of these changes, some of the things you're seeing. He's a former Jehovah's Witness, and he's going to explain to us tonight some of the strangest things that maybe you won't connect with. Maybe you'll have a hard time even understanding, but you will really enjoy what this man has to say. His name is Fritz Springmeier. He wrote a book called The Bloodlines of the Illuminati. Do you know what the Illuminati is? Well, some people, I mean, I know, and maybe some people are hearing this for the first time, but Fritz and others will tell you the Illuminati is a group that is an esoteric organization. And they are trying to manipulate mankind into some type of a new arrangement, some type of a reset. Fritz knows all about it. He's a knowledgeable man when it comes to what is taking place in the world. Fritz, are you on with us? Hello, Fritz. Yes, I am. <laughs> well, well we're, we're glad to have you, Fritz. My goodness, I've been getting people wanting you to come back on with us. So you're on with us tonight. So hi, Fritz. You doing okay? Yeah, relatively. And hello to all your audience. And, you know, Rick, we've done some great shows. And uh, hopefully this will be one more great show. So thanks for having me on again. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, what, what I'm finding when I go into the archives of the six screens, uh, so many people are checking out that program that you're on. More and more witnesses are leaving right now than ever before. And, you know, some of them don't go as deep as the Illuminati, but you have to go deep. You have to understand there are esoteric or secretive societies out there that people have no awareness of. So you're going to bring some of this to our attention tonight, right? Uh, yes. Tonight I want to deal with three very important subjects. So I'll, I'll go through what I want to discuss. The first subject pertains to the Watchtower Society. As many of your listeners know, I've been investigating, just like you were saying, tracking and exposing the satanic elite who control the world order. And I'm revealing tonight how to create a religion with total thought control. They know how to do this. Hey, hey man, what, what do you think about Jordan Maxwell? Uh, we're, that's that's another subject. We're going to open this up to questions later, but let me let me see if I can discuss these topics, okay? And so uh, they know how to how to create the conference has been locked. Thought control, and then they've repeatedly done that. So tonight, I'm exposing to you all the framework used to create the Watchtower organization. And then next, I want to briefly did you, touch on... Did, did you know... Uh, please, don't interrupt. please don't interrupt. Um, uh, um, Rick, uh, is it possible to... This man has been giving us some trouble. I'm, I'm going to get him out of here, and we're going to lock it, and he's not going to be able to come back on again. He's been nothing but a problem all night long. So just bear with us here, and we'll get them off. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Fritz. All right, you're all set. Go ahead. Okay, so, okay, so the next thing after is explaining, breaking down about how to create a religion with total thought control, I wanted to briefly touch on... The conference has been unlocked. The conference has been locked. They will enforce compliance to everything, to everyone or most everyone. And then the final topic 
or segment is the heart of this interview. It's the most important thing. And then I will show you how they will take everything away from us. They say, you'll own nothing, be happy. I'm going to show you how. Not just explain, but document it. Now, before we deal with these topics, and that is, if it's okay with Rick for me to plow into them, before we deal with these topics, it's critical to warn people that we need to approach this information with a Christ-like mind. That's because when I was studying mind control, I learned that there's six different brains. There's the pons and medulla reptilian brain, but there's a, the highest brain is like Christ-like. And if we, if we live in fear, we're living in this reptilian brain, but we, we really need to have an elevated consciousness. And I'm not promoting new age Christ-like consciousness. I'm just saying that the way the brain works, we need to be walk in courage and love. And that's very powerful. You know, that's the higher brain. And that's the highest brain is what what the Holy Spirit wants us to be uh, using. So I encourage people not to be fearful and to be courageous and and have faith and hope. Okay, I'm, I'm not trying to give a sermon, but it's important that uh, we have that attitude because I'm not trying to scare people. Okay, is it okay for me to discuss these subjects, Rick? Well, of course, it's okay for you to discuss these subjects. Okay. People, people are people are just uh, on the edge of their seat. They want to hear it. Okay, well, hold on to your seat. Grab your popcorn. Put on your listening ears. And uh, then, after we do these three important topics, we can open it up for questions or comments. But uh, please, people, have patience with me while I break this down because. There's a lot of information here, and if I get interrupted, it, it just really throws a, a monkey wrench in us understanding things. So here's how to create a religion with total thought control, right? There's eight elements to it, and uh, I'm going to surprise people at the end by documenting a little bit where they can actually go to see what I'm saying. Now, there are secret documents that break things down even better than this, but I can't get to those secret documents, but I'm telling you they exist. The world order knows very specifically how to create a mind control, thought control religion like the Jehovah's Witnesses, and they very systematically did that. So if you uh, have been a Jehovah's Witness, Listen to this and see if you can't recognize what I'm talking about. The first element is milieu control. That means the, the environment, so to speak. And um, examples of that would be don't go to college, don't have bad associations, don't read apostate literature, stay, stay very busy at the Kingdom Hall, and surround your life with Jehovah's Witnesses and Watchtower material. You've all, you're all familiar with that. The next one is, is the religion or organization. It doesn't have to be a religion. It could be the Communist Party. They have a They are uh, present themselves as having a mystique of chosen by history and or God. See, this mystique is, uh, of being chosen by history or God is to carry out an important agenda. Any thought that questions this higher purpose is a lower purpose, thwarting its higher purpose. It, you're expected to trust the party or religion which manipulates you. If the power of the party or religion begins to dis, distrust or if the, if the pawn, that's what I'm trying to say, if that pawn, I'm using the word pawn because that, that's, that's what people become. They, they just become a pawn of these these organizations, the pawn of the organization begins to distrust or finds himself unable to escape the forces of the party or religion. 
emerges with the tide rather than fight it. This requires endless rounds of self-betrayal and betrayals of others as he joins the manipulation of the party or religion. So uh, an example of that in, in, in terms of Watchtower Society, God in history have chosen the Watchtower Society to proclaim his kingdom. And then the third element is total purity to the religion's party line. You know, the party or religion expects total purity towards the party line. All thought is divided into pure and impure, black and white, or absolutely good and absolutely evil. All sources of tainting must be searched out and eliminated. Anything done to the pawn in the name of purity is moral. And you see that happen in the Jehovah's Witnesses a lot. Doesn't matter what you do to that poor, poor J, JW, if it's done in the name of purity, it's, it's moral, it's good. In their war for pure thought, totalists create a small thought world full of shame and guilt. So the pawn constantly strives for pure thought as defined in the moment by the party or religion. Doesn't matter, it's an organization. Each person is made aware of his limitations and vulnerabilities. The controllers, the ideological totalists, become the ultimate judges of good and evil, just like what we were talking about earlier uh, on the previous show. You know, uh, they have a judicial council, truth or untruth. With, they become the ultimate judges of truth or untruth within their world. They're able to determine deviation and punishment and have the power to forgive the pawn who evaluates his character and actions and thoughts relative to the party line or religious line. He relieves his inner guilt by denouncing outside influences which threaten the party or religious line. This is projection. The pawn no longer is sensitive to the nuances and complexities of human morality and is free from the responsibility of moral discernment. He can just follow the party line or religious line. So you, you see, an, an example of this is the faithful and wise servant equals truth. Stay in the truth. Stay with the party line. Stay pure in thought. Impure thought must be cleansed out. Stay in touch with God's channel of communication and the new truth it dispenses. Hopefully this is hitting a, um, a positive chord with people that are listening out there. Um, so the next one, number four, the fourth uh, element is the use of confession to purify. The PR uses confession to purify. The pure the pure, uh, the party or religion organization will demand confessions to crimes not committed to exploit the power of the party or religion. You see this in the Jehovah's Witnesses all the time. Somebody doesn't even commit a crime, but they exploit their power. They claim total ownership of every pawn in the world. The mind is not privately owned by the peon. It is owned by the party or religion. Even memory and history becomes under the party or religious ownership. Confession creates a oneness with fellow confessors who also join the approved thinking. Um, so, real searching and real evaluation of moral questions is stifled. Just accept the party line. Real access to real inner truth is shut off, and the peon looks inward, excuse me, doesn't look inwardly, but looks outwardly for truth and moral judgment. Self surrender to the party or religion is demanded. The more the peon judges himself by the party standards, the more he judges others too by their standards. So, uh, examples of that is the party or the organization or the religion 
needs those who fail to stay pure to confess because the organization claims total ownership of the person. A committee, judicial committee representing the organization will judge you and tell you what to confess. Um, the fifth element is dogma is sacred. It, it's unquestionable. It's airtight, what they're saying. You know, do not question basic assumptions of the party line. The party line is sacred. The party line is ultimate type. Don't dare to criticize it or harbor questions about it. The party line blinds ideas become God. The party line is a doctrine true for all men at all time, even though it changes. <laughs> This provides security for the peon who no longer has to think for himself the world of experience will conflict with the party line. But if this is recognized, the peon will feel guilty and fear and close his eyes to the facts. True truth and experience are necessary for true self-expression and creativity. Spiritual creativity and true spiritual self-expression is vital. And examples of that, um, well, don't question our date for the fall of Jerusalem, you know, or the evil world has a, a, a false date. Our date is true. You know, don't question that the watchtower is the faithful and wise servant. You know, don't question our interpretation of Matthew 24, 45 through 46, which is that parable about the faithful and wise servant, you know, which goes, and, and I'm quoting, uh, I don't remember which Bible I took this out of. Um, Who then is the faithful and, and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? You know, basically it's asking who qualifies to oversee the, the kitchen or who will to oversee that. But, you know, what, what was Jesus really going? Where was he going with this parable? Well, I'm going to throw out that if we understood how things went back then, you know, rich people had several estates. And they set up managers in charge who needed to be ready for when the owner would arrive because the owner would bounce from one one property to the next, right? So Jesus is asking, what should the owner expect of this manager? You know, the manager should be prepared for a surprise visit. You know, and this all this was still going on in the Middle Ages. But like if you look at a lord in France, they would have several castles in the state, and then he would move with his family between each one, and they would have to disassemble their furniture. That's why in French the word for furniture became mobilier because that meant that the furniture was mobile pieces, you know. So every manager at their estates needed to be ready for the Lord to, to visit them. So what I'm throwing out here to give, give a little bit more in-depth thought to this is when Jesus, or if we want to use the word Yeshua, which was the way it, it would have been said back then, when Yeshua gave this parable to his disciples, was he really talking to them about the Watchtower Society? Think about it. Think, people. Think outside the Watchtower box. Was Jesus Christ referring to Watchtower Society when he talked to his disciples uh, with, about this parable? No, he was not talking about the Watchtower Society. But see, the, when, you, when you get into this thought control that the Watchtower Society gives you, you can't think outside the box and question that Jesus wasn't even referring to the Watchtower Society when he, when he gave that parable. This is something entirely different. So the sixth element is the party or religion will create spatial language. Thought control is made easier by cliches and saying such language should such language jargon gets around critical thinking. You know, um, the peon 
must use the correct party jargon. The person's thought is constricted. He is linguistically deprived. One's mental capacity for free thought is narrow to controllable limits because thinking and feeling is connected to language, right? So let's, let's come up with some examples in terms of the Watchtower Society. So they use the word the truth. What does that mean in their dog, in jargon? Watchtower dogma, you know? This is a little bit like religious language is what I'm talking about here, right? And then they'll say, in the truth. That's an expression, we're in the truth. Well, what's that mean? We're in watchtower dogma. So they, they use the word term Bible study. What does that really mean? Jehovah's Witness literature study, you know? Theocratic warfare. What is, what's that? Lying to outsiders. What about theocracy? Well, that means actually submission to the Watchtower Society. Or what about the term new life? Well, that means a change in doctrine. <laughs> and um, oh, let's just look at, look at some of the other. I mean, there's so much religious jargon. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm hoping that the listener can think of some of the, of the terms and some other terms himself. But just let, let, let's just look at the word, the term Gentile times, you know, which is according to Watchtower Dogma from 607 BC, which is a fake day, to 1914. Okay, well, Gentile times is not a biblical term, right? So they bash what they call Christendom. That's another one of their derogatory terms, but means everybody term for all other believers, but anyway, they say Christendom believes in the Trinity, and Trinity is not a biblical term. Well, neither is Gentile times. Um, what they do is, is, is they take Luke 21, 24, and they say that it, they do scriptural gymnastics, and they replace the word nations with Gentile. You know, I mean, this is, this, this is the dishonest stuff that they do, and people don't don't call them on it because they're they're locked into this party line. You know, they use terms like anointed class, which is like Jehovah's Witnesses, back calls, visiting interested persons, Bethel was used to be their headquarters, um, great crowd, Jehovah's Witnesses not selected for heaven, publishers, pioneers, culpateurs was the more older word. They had this all this religious doctrine. Or, I mean, dog, religious jargon is what I'm trying to say. Um, now, the next element is doctrine is supreme over the person. The reality as experience must be denied for the party line myth. Because feelings are reinterpreted by the person to match doctrine, the outsider sees the controlled person as living in a half reality. Did, did you catch what I'm saying here, people? Somebody who's not a Jehovah's Witness looks at it and they go, these people aren't living in reality. Um, and why? Is because they're reinterpreting what's going on around them in relationship to the party line. So I, I, I'll give some quick examples of that, like a blood transfusion. No, that's not a blood transfusion. It's eating blood, you know, but... If you logically think things through. The conference has been unlocked. Zake, which has lots of blood. Oh, no, that's not eating, that's not eating blood. Um, oh, here's another thing. The Watchtower doesn't make false predictions. The individual Jehovah's Witness read too much into the Watchtower statements about 1975, you see. Um, apostate, what does that mean? That's a look, you know, that means... From their perspective, from their, their watchtower eyes, someone who fell away from Jehovah. When in reality, it may be someone who fell away from watchtower lies and false watchtower doctrine. You see where I'm going with this? How it constricts your thinking? This is thought control. And then the last element is existence of the individual depends on conversion and submission. Because the organization is equal to God. And that's very important one. So uh, 
you know, what what we're getting is is a convert versus someone who's born again. You know, you submit to an organization rather than being led by by Yahweh God. Jesus said, "Let no man be your teacher." Right? Um, in First uh, John two twenty seven, that the anointing which you have received of Him abides in you, and ye need not any man teach you. That's scripture, but it's a scripture that that doesn't fit into Watchtower doctrine, so you, so we're not going to bring that one out. <laughs> uh, so this, these eight elements as a package is ideological totalism. It destroys the human potential. The peon, the subject, is deprived of the spiritual journey of seeking God, seeking truth, and enlightenment, and is simply ordered to accept this box or package of truth. Do not think outside the box. His religious experiences, uh, his, or I should say experience, is a simple destination. It's not a journey of exploration. Under the pretense of eliminating human imperfections, the subject is relegated to a paint-by-number piece of art rather than a divine-inspired masterpiece. God wants to make us into divine-inspired masterpieces, but that's all still birthed by the Watchtower Society. Um, let me see if think here if there was anything else that, um, oh, yeah, yeah, I was going to tell you that uh, this is, this is not, um, this is not unknown by the system. And like I say, there are secret documents that go into how to create a religion, but those are under, under secrecy, lock, lock and key, so to speak. But you can find one place where this comes out, and that Robert J. Lipton, who was a shrink, in uh, 1961, he came out with a book entitled Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism, or Totalism, excuse me, A Study of Brainwashing in China, right? And that got reprinted in 1989 by the University of North Carolina Press. Go to chapter 22, and you will see all eight of those features that I was talking to you about a total thought control. I'm, I'm saying this so that people realize the reality that this religion, Watch Our Society, there was a blueprint, and they they knew exactly what they were doing when they created this thought control religion. And this is just general. This isn't even touching on the trauma-based mind control that I've talked about in other uh, in, in other talks on on this show, and, and written three books on the trauma-based mind control. So, uh, my my in-between topic before I go to the important one is the kill switches and the reason that they give for putting mandatory kill switches into all cars is they say that there's intoxicated drivers out there so that they need to be able to kill their kill their cars from running. So they had a bipartisan bill that passed that makes kill switches. Um, in the future, they're going to be mandatory. Um, well, you might say, well, I, I'm not going to buy a new car. I don't want a kill switch. I don't want somebody uh, sitting somewhere else able to uh, stop me from turning turning on my car or turning my car off when I'm driving it. No way. I'm not going to get one of those. Well, it's the end of older, older cars. And here's what, and, and, and this has come out by um, an insider. You won't be able to insure your old cars because you will need a digital car. And see, 
Uh, if you haven't paid your premium, your car won't start. If you haven't been obedient to the world order, your car won't stop. You know, if you've been, if, if you're, if you're getting on radio like I am and exposing the world system, heh, got to punish disobedience. Your vehicle won't stop. You know, but I won't even be able to get. Uh, I won't even be able to get insured, probably. But you're you're forced to get a politically correct car. Um, so if you want to drive, you want to get to work. You know, you're going to have to buckle under and do what they want. Now that's just one way that they're going to get your compliance. But the important, the next subject that I'm going to do, and uh, I don't know, I think this might be about 45 minutes to present this information because I'm going to get some documentation here, Rick. Um, and Rick, thanks again for having me on. Um, well, Chris, we're so uh, glad. We we're so glad to have you come on with us. I mean, you're sharing information that you know no one's ever heard before. So. We're all listening intently. We got a lot of people listening in to the six screens tonight. Thank you, Fritz. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to break down how the global uh, control, police controllers plan to get us to the point we will own nothing and be happy. You know, if, if, if we finish in time, I might even tell some interesting stories that are relevant to the discussion today. But anyway, I'm I'm breaking it down to three major parts today. First, I'll explain a model for the upcoming deflation, which is the, the Great Depression that the United States went through. Second, we'll discuss homelessness and FEMA because that's the crisis that's going to be created. And third, I'll just get into the really the heart, the meat of this talk, and that's how all securities globally not in the United States, globally, all stocks and bonds will be seized. And people, your property rights to these are already gone. You'll be shot. So let's get into it. So um, Klaus Schwab, as, as we've been saying, it doesn't hurt to repeat this, he predicts we'll own nothing and be happy. You know, well, who is this Klaus Schwab? Well, Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum is an Illuminati member. And, the, and I know this as a fact, people. The big Illuminati champions are members of the World Economic Forum and attend its gatherings like at Davos. Excuse me. I can't look there. When Klaus Schwab speaks, he speaks for the Illuminati. What lies behind their confidence in that prediction? Okay, it's my goal in this interview to lay out a secret agenda by the elite. This agenda is not being warned about by the awake community, at least not that I know. Um, in fact, I think some of the things that the popular public financial whistleblowers are warning about may possibly be distraction to keep our attention away from the biggest danger. If you were in the Illuminati shoe, how would you take everyone's property? Think about that. Well, very easy. Just use the pattern of the Great Depression, which was also called a period of deflation. All right. Hold on to that word deflation. During the Great Depression, money became rare. The velocity of money slowed down and stagnated. People could not get money to pay their mortgages, their bills. The taxes, banks foreclosed on properties, local government seized land for back taxes, and property like cars were repossessed. Many people lost everything. Okay? Even the safety net of gold didn't help, as the government seized all gold. For this next deflation, or I could say depression, they have sneaked into the laws the legal right of special elite financiers to seize all the world's stocks and bonds. Does the company have stock? Does the government, government entity issue bonds? 
All these ultimately belong to the elite. So Rothschild is going to make out like a bandit. So will some of his other Illuminati buddies. This last year, 2023, they got everything legally in place. So let's say you started in 1933 with a sizable bank account. I just illustrate all of them. A nice, big, beautiful home and plenty of gold as a safety net. In March 1933, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, by executive order, closed all banks. Now you can't get any of your money. All you have is your cash on hand and your gold. Only a few select banks were allowed by the government um, to reopen. They were the ones that were approved by the Federal Reserve, which, by the way, people, is a private institution where elites, whose elite stockholders are kept secret. Thousands of banks were never allowed to reopen. Your bank is not allowed to reopen, and you lose all your money. Within days, you are required to turn in all your gold. The penalty for not doing so is up to 10 years in prison. Because you simply own gold, the government has now labeled you a dangerous hoarder, threatening the nation. Without your money and gold, you fail to make your house payments and lose that too. Where does your cash flow come from? Your job. Well, what happens when jobs become scarce? You know. So what is going to trigger this next big financial crash? Well, that's sort of like asking which card in the house of cards will fall first. But here's some of the cards, people. Like, I'll call it card one. Like 2024 or 2025, who, which is World Health Organization, could be a global health dictator with power over government. Another card. World Economic Forum is sure we'll see a global or uh, an American cyber attack, what they call a cyber pandemic. The virus this time it is digital. Card number three, MP, EMP attack. Another card that can come into play is artificial intelligence, which will eliminate lots of jobs. This is basically what happened to millions of Americans. When nobody had money, a deflationary period set in, the Great Depression. Later, to regain people's trust in banks, the government created the FDIC to make people feel their bank deposits were safe. Even if the FDIC borrowed money, it really can only ensure two cents out of every hundred dollars on deposit. In a systemic bank crash, people, the FDIC will be of little help. In the coming crash, the elite have quietly rewritten the laws around the world, I'm talking about around the entire world, globally, so that all stocks and bonds, all financial securities are actually owned exclusively by the elite and not the individuals and companies who think they own these stocks and bonds. Yes, I know, this is shocking. It has taken years of subterfuge and compromising politicians and bankers to slip in laws taking all stocks and bonds away from those who bought them and who still think, therefore, they own them. This is not a theory, it is a fact, and I will quote to you the some document showing this theft of ownership. This evil secret theft is brilliant. It's been hidden by the mainstream media and the complex legal jargon employed in these new global laws. And uh, I I was tempted it, 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 I don't really know when's the best time to bring in some of this, some of the things I, I have to say. I, I was going to cover a bunch of 
satanic reversals that they do in their uh, their financial jargon. Um, but I think I will wait a little bit. Um, anyway, China's already into deflation, people. What happens in deflation? Money becomes scarce, and therefore people can't find the money to pay their mortgages, rents, and property taxes. This will lead to widespread homelessness. See, this is the crisis I'm going to describe, homelessness. Large-scale homelessness is a crisis, a national emergency, which in the USA will trigger FEMA coming to the rescue. What does FEMA stand for, people? Federal Emergency Management Agency. What is FEMA a department of? It is a department of the department. It is part of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, it's specifically Department of Homeland Security, and there's a long title, Office of State and Local Government Coordination and Preparedness. That, that's what it is. Yeah, Office of State and Local Government Coordination and Preparedness. Mouthful. So what is FEMA's mission? Well, its mission, and I'm quoting from page 12 of the FEMA handbook, is, quote, to provide a unified national response to major disasters and emergencies. Okay, so if we have a national emergency of homelessness, then that gives FEMA the legal right to come in and deal with homelessness. So some of FEMA's missions that were similar to what I'm talking about, and uh, which is a national response to homelessness, would include the 1980 Cuban refugee crisis, where FEMA processed 100,000 Cuban refugees. And another would be their Katrina response, uh, Hurricane Katrina, where FEMA bused survivors to coliseums and then sent them on to all 50 states for resettlement. So, uh, Rick, it's, 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 uh, it's important to understand how these crises are created and manipulated by the elite controllers. I began exposing this process back in 1990. The hidden hand of the elite global string cores planned these things 40 years in advance. I'm telling you that. That's a fact. At least 40 years in advance. Very systematically planned. So let's look at homelessness. I used to live in Oregon. I moved away in March 2017. Oregon is an excellent example of homelessness. Oregon has the highest rate of chronic homelessness in the nation, and Eugene, Oregon has the highest rate of homelessness of any city in the United States. If you are a string puller, how, could, how would you create a homeless crisis? Well, check these things out. Between 1978 and 2015, 40% of the rental units that were affordable to minimum wage workers in Portland, Oregon, were quietly destroyed. You tend to think that as cities expand in population, your housing also expands. Why destroy 40% of your low-income rental? Meanwhile, homeless Social programs were increasing, making homelessness more attractive in Oregon. So next step, in 1995, a friendly old school cop told me that all the good police, you know, the kind, decent, upright citizen serving police, and those, all of them in Portland were being transferred to the small towns, and they were being replaced with sadistic bullies. The Portland police earned a reputation for police brutality. Then in June 2020, the Portland City Council defunded the police, and immediately that year, homicides increased by 83%. Homeless people began camping everywhere in Portland, and people became afraid to go downtown, and lots of businesses left. All the Walmarts in Portland closed. What does it take for a Walmart to leave an area? <laughs> the homeless problem was at its worst two years ago. It's been getting better. 
I would contend the homeless problem was created. <laughs> uh, so American consumers are already making lots of hardship withdrawals to the retirement 401k, the highest credit card debt ever. We're in the highest credit card debt ever. Consumers are failing to make their payments. Go to Seattle, Portland, Las Vegas, and see all the hundreds and thousands of homeless living everywhere to, in makeshift tents. The Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, counted 582,000 homeless Americans in 2022. That's, that's over half a million. Last I looked, California had 161,548 homeless people. New York, um, 91,271 homeless people. And one third of these are families, people. In New York City, homelessness is at, at the highest level since the Great Depression. And we haven't even had deflation yet. So these liberal Democrat states, California, Oregon, Washington, Nevada, so you look at their homeless rate. California has, and this is all per 10,000 people, right? So California, 44 people, homeless people per 10,000. 10, Oregon, 42 per 10,000. Washington, 33 per 10,000. Nevada, 24 per 10,000. Okay, now I'll come back over um, from the West Coast and, and, and come to the area of the country I live in. And like Kansas, we have eight homeless people per 10,000. And Oklahoma, nine homeless per 10,000. And Iowa, eight persons per 10,000. You see that the, the, these Democratic liberal states on the West Coast have raised their four to five times the Midwest region where I live. That's, that's telling. So, you know, I've talked, and I'm not sure, I've, I've given a number of shows where I talked about CBDCs, central bank digital currencies. I think I may have talked about them in a previous program here. But they need a crisis to justify their mandatory use. So um, the, when, when a CBDC comes in, how will you pay your property taxes and car taxes if you don't want to use it? You know, you won't be able to. You, another way that you will have to be compliant. And with the CBDC, they can control what money's in your bank account. If they don't like what you're doing and you're not politically correct, they can just seize your money or they can stop a transaction. So, uh, you know, client funds can be confiscated to cover institutional banking losses. And this was done already by Judge Martin Glenn. It's also been done in Cyprus, but, but Judge Glenn in the MF Global Bankruptcy which was a large Wall Street firm that collapsed, clients lost their money. You know, there was $1.6 billion that they had um, in accounts with that commodity broker. Now, a lot of them had segregated customer funds. We're going to talk about that. Um, and, and those weren't any safer than anything else. Canadian customers, because Canadian law is different, they were able to get their money in 10 days. But American investors didn't get their money for about three years, up to three years. So imagine you have money, you have money in this uh, Wall Street firm, and, and um, you have, have your money invested in commodities, and you can't get it for three years. Well, you've essentially lost it. You've lost use of it, even if eventually the, the court's going to give you that money. But it's, it gets worse than it. Uh, you're not even going to get it in, in, the, in the future. 
Now, one of the things I guess I'm gonna I'm gonna say it right now. I I, I wanted to keep this as, as simple as possible, but I also wanted to show you that there's a whole bunch of satanic reversals in their economic legal terms. You know, like they have switched ownership of a security as property, they have switched it to security entitlement, which is a contractual claim position that is meaningless to a, in a financial crisis. Um, they use the term safe harbor. Now, that sounds really nice, safe harbor, you know, but what it really means is it's made, making it safe for the elite to steal. The elite called secured creditors have priority claims to all security. It means literally the elite are safe to steal all the securities. That's what safe harbor means. Um, legal certainty, again, that's uh, something that sounds good, but it's got a satanic reversal to it. It is legally certain that the elite can legally steal people's security assets. That's what legal certainty means. Um, <laughs> so, Rick, for 40 years, I've heard people challenge me, where's your proof, Fritz? Not that they really want it in a lot of cases. In plenty of cases, it's just their way of blowing one's unwanted information off. But what I'm exposing is big. It's a bombshell. And so I want to give the proof. Your listeners are a select group of aware, discerning individuals. If anyone will grasp what I'm warning about, they will. And I'm going to quote five documents. Um, now, they say, keep things simple. Uh, or to quote it, keep things simple, stupid. I'm going to break things down as simple as you're going to ever hear them, people. And it's still going to be enormously complicated. Why? Because the elite have worked diligently to make things so obtuse, so complex, that the common person won't be able to figure out what they've done globally. Yes, globally. They have put in lots of hard work, lots of blackmailing and bribing for years to get this quietly done. So the language, the financial legal language is difficult. I broke the proof down uh, to explain things, and I broke it down to five documents. And uh, I'm going to explain six legal financial terms used in these documents, okay? So if you can follow this, you'll realize what's been done secretly to exacerbate deflation, right? Um, again, like I said, before I read the proof, you need to know certain legal financial jargon or all this proof will go right over the listener's head. It may still go over people's heads. But anyway, the term, first term I'm going to talk about is secured transactions. This is a transaction where collateral is given to guarantee payment of an obligation. But what is the collateral spoken about in this questionnaire that you're going to hear? You'll be surprised to know that the stock or bond you buy is already collateral which has been lumped with other bonds and stocks into a pool. Even if you have explicitly prohibited your stock or bond from being used as collateral, it is still placed in a pool, and you can receive only a pro rata share of residual assets, which in reality means you receive nothing. All stocks and bonds, whether used as collateral or not, are pooled, and all these pools have been used by what is called account providers to borrow money from. So all pools have creditors who have loaned money based on these, those pools being used as collateral. These creditors are called secured creditors, secured creditors, and are a secret special set of elite financiers. Okay, the next term I, you need to understand, segregated investment. Segregated investments mean the client stocks and bonds have not been commingled with the brokerage firm's assets. So in theory, if a company goes bankrupt, out of business, the client's money slash assets can be promptly returned, okay, 
And then the third term on this document I'm about to read is security entitlement holder. By skillful subterfuge, the owner of stocks and bonds has been reclassified as an, quote, entitlement holder, end quote, and no longer is the owner of the stock and bond. He's just an entitlement holder. In a crisis, security entitlement means nothing as the secured creditor will always get the value of the stock and bond first. And I'm going to sh I'm going to read to you a document showing that. So the document I'm reading, the European Union Clearing and Settlement Legal Certainty Group sent out a questionnaire to the New York Federal Reserve. That was in 2005. So this is New York Federal Reserve's reply to the EU Clearing and Settlement Legal Certainty Group question by, by the EU. In respect of what legal system are the following answers given? That we want to know the basis of the, the answers that they're going to give. The New York Fed answers. This response confines itself to U.S. commercial law, primarily Article 8 and parts of Article 9 of the Uniform Commercial Code, UCC. The subject matter of Article 8 is investment securities, and the subject of Article 9 is secured transactions. There's that word, see, secured transactions. Article 8 and Article 9 have been adopted throughout the United States. It's a question by the certainty group. Where securities are held in pooled form, e.g. a collective securities position, rather than segregated individual positions per person, does the investor have rights attaching to particular securities in the pool? Answer by the, the New York Fed. No, the security entitlement holder has a pro rata share of the interest in the financial asset held by its securities intermediary. This is true even if investor positions are segregated. Question, is the investor protected against the insolvency of an intermediary? And if so, how? Answer by the New York Fed. An investor is always vulnerable to a securities intermediary that does not itself have the interest in a financial asset sufficient to cover all of the securities entitlement that it has created in that financial asset. If the secured creditor, there's that word, secured creditor, has control over the financial asset, it will have priority over entitlement holders. If the securities intermediary is a clearing corporation, the claims of its creditors have priority over the claims of entitlement holders. There are all those terms I was talking to you about. Entitlement holders. The entitlement holder is, is technically the person that bought the stock, you know, the secure, secure creditor, who they say have control over it, he's this elite uh, Illuminati financier that's hidden behind the scenes. And, um, you know, it, it talks about, in this document, pool of form, collective securities position, you know, does he have rights? And they say no. No, he doesn't. So they're right there in, in, right there in living language. You see what's going on. Now, this next document I'm going to talk about is the European Commission Directive 2002-47-EC of the European Parliament. Right? This is, um, it, it was sent out on 6 June 2002, and it's on financial collateral arrangements. And it's in regards to harmonization and financial collateral arrangements. Okay. And um, so I need to go over two terms for you to understand this document. Legal certainty. Legal certainty means 
that the laws will, without question, give the secured creditor, those special elite financiers, the whole value of the stocks and bonds in a crisis. Because those stocks and bonds have been used as collateral for money loaned by the elite. And then the second term is harmonization, which is what this document is about, is about harmonization. Harmonization means that all the laws of all the nations are in harmony to give the select elite all stocks and bonds in a crisis. So now I'm going to read a quote, direct quote. In order to improve the legal certainty of financial collateral arrangements, member states should ensure or should ins yeah, ensure that certain provisions of insolvency law do not apply to such arrangements, in particular, those that would inhibit the effective realization of financial collateral. So they're telling all their people, get in line with this, you know, let's do this right. Um, the next document I'm going to go through, uh, it's a Bank of International Settlements document, this, you know, um, and um, the actual title of it is Developments in Collateral Management Services, came out in 2014. Uh, there was a 2014 report by the Committee on Global Financial Systems at this, and then a title of a similar report to this one that I'm going to quote is Asset Encumbrance Financial Reform and the Demand for Collateral Assets, and that was put out in 2013, and then the next year they put out a similar one, and I'm going to quote, uh, oh, oh, I didn't give the term, the, the, curtain, the term that you need to understand, the, the economic term, is free of payment settlement. The special, that means the special elite can get paid their settlement of, of affairs free of charge. In other words, they can take all the stocks and bonds without paying a cent, is what it means. So here's the language of the quote. The direct quote is, quote, if the collateral giver does not have sufficient security in the ICSD environment, it can source collateral by transferring securities from its own account at the linked CSD to its securities account in the ICSD with a repayment settlement occurring in the linked CSD. Free of, free of payment, FOP, people. That means that uh, they get that collateral free. They, they get it for free. <laughs> And they're not going to pay for it. <laughs> um, and uh, one more document here, then I'm going to give you an exact quote. This is a legal disclosure of the, and I'm not very good with Scandinavian languages. This is Swedish, Skandinaviska in Skilda Banken. Um, which means Scandinavian Unified Bank, and they had to give a disclosure in 2023. And this legal disclosure, quote, in the unlikely event of a shortfall of securities, the client in question will not be able to claim a right of separation, but will likely be considered as an unsecured creditor without priority to the assets of the bankruptcy estate. So, you know, the client will be an unsecured creditor in contrast with these elite people behind the scenes who are, you know, secured creditors, you know. So there's a lot more documents that, that back that up, but um, uh, oh, there is another document I, I have here. That's the Single Resolution Board Work Program 2023. And so it's going to use the pandemic in Ukraine war as a pretext that all the legal goals for stealing securities, as well as all the legal supports to keep select banks open and secure creditors um, paid during a crisis are going to be achieved. 
Europe's resolution board is like our FDIC. They call it a resolution board. We call it the FDIC. The resolution board is to protect big banks and secure creditors in the event of financial meltdown. So here's an excerpt from the, it's the, the SRB, which means Single Resolution Board Work Program 2023. The SRB's 2023 work program, I'm quoting, is set against a backdrop of great uncertainty. While the start of 2022 saw economies beginning to emerge from the pandemic, 2023 will see added challenges in part stemming from Russian aggression in Ukraine. Rising energy costs have led to double-digit inflation in many parts of the banking union. Now more than ever, it is important we finalize the work on banking resolvability and ensure that all the goals set out in the SRB's expectations for banks are met before the year is out. This was the initial target date, and we are on track to meet it. In other words, you know, you have to harmonize, you have to get in line with this goal um, to, to, to have the laws allow the secured creditors to steal these, these bonds, and we're going to get it done by the end of this year, which they did. So here's the bottom line, people. The financial experts are going to spout the Illuminati party line that the crash happened because everyone screamed. People live beyond their means, running up debt. See, when this depression happens, the people are going to be blamed, just like the Watchtower Society blames people for their, their false prophecies, you know, or other things. The governments, governments have spent beyond their means, running up debt, but we are all to blame. The authorities and regulators have struggled hard for years to protect us from our animal lust. No matter how hard certain people work to protect us from ourselves, they failed. We are all to blame, and the entire system must be reset. Controls must be in place to make sure money is spent wisely. We'll start all over with no one having anything but these central bank digital dollars. Deposit in your, in your account and usable by your cell phone or later an embedded chip in your hand. So see, this is how they, they take everything from us and then make us happy because they put all of this free money back into our deposit into our accounts that we can use through our cell phone or later an embedded chip in our hand. But what it is, is, is it's just a way to make us totally dependent on them. Um, now, that was what I had, um, and that didn't take so long, uh, that I wanted to share. Um, I could tell a story. Um, you, I'll, I'll ask Rick. Rick, you want me to, to tell a story in line with all of this, or shall we go? Well, no, my, my, my all mind, go ahead, go ahead, tell a story, Fritz. I think they want to hear the story, so tell the story, Fritz. <laughs> you're so, you're so kind. Um, you know, so I was, I was investigating a murder. It was a murder involving uh, a victim of trauma-based mind control. And so I was, and this was in Oregon. And so I was. I was looking into the Philomath area, and I was going back and trying to understand the relationships with people and everything. And what I discovered was, is this Rex Clemens, uh, during the Depression, everybody in that area was losing their homes, losing their properties, losing everything. Because like I said, during the Great Depression, Money stagnated. Nobody had any money to pay their taxes or bills. And so the courthouses were selling people's property for back taxes. And there was a man there, Rex Clemens, and he just quietly bought up all this stuff. And um, if you wondered later, well, where did this guy get the money? 
why people would just say, well, he's rich. He owns all this land. Well, how did he get all this land? You know, nobody would go back. They're just used circular. Well, he's, he's rich because he has all this land. That's why he's able to afford all this land. Well, no. Where did he get all this? Well, he wasn't rich to begin with. What happened was is that he was uh, buddy buddies with Avril Harriman. Well, who's Avril Harriman? You know, he was a member of the Satanic Order of Skull and Bones. He was a good friend of Satanist Dallas Crowley. Uh, he had a large fortune. He, he was a member of Club of Rome, Council of Foreign Relations. Uh, he was the founder of Brown Brothers Harriman and Whitney. So this is who Admiral Harriman is. So what, what really happened is, is the big boys funneled him money. And then Rex Clemens, as he went around Paloma, he just handed out money to people and he, everybody was in his pocket. And um, it's really strange because when I was doing this research, all of a sudden I realized um, what he had done was, is, and he had two homes. He had a place in Paloma, but later he had a, a, a place out in Diamond, which is a ghost town in uh, near Burns, Oregon, out in the desert. I guess you could call it desert. I would. Um, he had a, a place out in Diamond. So anyway... Uh, the Crane Buchanan uh, High School out there near Diamond and the Paloma High School, if you graduated from either of those two high schools, Rex Clemens would pay all of your college. Well, my I had an uncle, and he was like a New Age guru, and he went around the country and I don't know how he found out about this, but he moved to Paloma. And I tell you what, none of my cousins, my uncle and neither my uncle or aunt, nobody told me that if you went to that high school, you'd get all your college paid for. I tell you what, if I had known that, I would have, I would have moved to Paloma. <laughs> Good deal there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, if you graduated from there, so all my cousins, they had their college paid for. Um, they quietly did this. And then when I confronted them, when I found this out, they said, well, we didn't keep it secret. Really? Well, that's pretty amazing. It's, am it's amazing how people know what they can and can't say, and they keep quiet about things, you know. Um, I, I've gone around the country doing research into deep underground military bases and other things, and it's amazing how people can be, it's like asking someone, well, what do you know? They, they live next to a Walmart and you ask them, well, what do you think about Walmart? And they go, I, I've never seen a Walmart. What's that? You know? So I went out to Diamond, right? And Diamond's a ghost town. They've got a hotel that's open during uh, summer. And then there's a, a house next to it. And then a few, uh, oh, a short distance from that house is uh, this, it's an arch that says Clemens Ranchero, right? So Rex Clemens lived there. And I went there and I asked the guy at that house, I said, well, what can you tell me about Rex Clemens? You know, and he says, who, what? Never heard of that before. <laughs> Never heard of Rex Clemens before. Um, pretty amazing. All he had to do was, Oh, you know, drive down the road and right there's a fine Clemens Ranchero, but supposedly he's never heard of it, doesn't know what I'm talking about. So anyway, uh, Rex was was fed all of this money and he bought up all of this land. And then in the 50s, he was buying up this land during the Depression and um, also bribing and paying everybody, telling People, whatever your dream is, I'll, I'll give you the money to, to reach it. So everybody in the area is in his pocket. Anyway, in the 50s, he quietly sells all this land to the big uh, um, 
companies that that the lumber companies that are owned by the elite, and, and all this happened quietly. I'm probably the only person that picked up on all this. So anyway, this is the kind of stuff that's going to happen during a deflationary period. Is they're going to come out ahead, and and you're going to you're going to look and see their own companies go bankrupt, and you're going to go, oh man, that Rothschild Bank or that Rothschild business just went bankrupt. Believe me, people, they have they have the means, they have the safety net that when things collapse, they will come out on top. Not that they're they're already on top, but they're even gonna they're gonna make out like bandits and take what we have. So I've just broke down to you people how they will <coughs> take all of our assets is by a deflation. Oh, and I might explain this. This deflationary period has to last for a while, right? It, it, it can't be just you know, and and it might be. You go into deflation and then inflation. You know, we might bounce around a little bit because they like to make things less obvious. But at some point, we have to go into a long period of deflation because that's where all the money will dry up and that's how they will take everything. And that's where we'll become homeless and there'll be a homeless crisis and on and on. So. I've just broken down to you the whole methodology there that they have in place. Um, so I've done a lot of talking. I think that I would like to open it up for uh, questions or comments by the listeners. Thanks for, for staying with me through all of this. I know it's kind of heavy duty stuff. But I needed to document things so you, you just realized I wasn't just talking off the top of my head. Well, if you'd like to come in, my goodness gracious, hit star six on your telephone pad. But love to have you come in. Say hello to Fritz. Uh, go ahead. We uh, would love to have you come in. Uh, we've got a number of people coming in on the six screens tonight. So. Let's see what happens. Fritz has been spilling the beans here in the Watchtower as well as on what's going on in the world tonight. So if you've got a question for Fritz, by all means, come on right now. Let's listen to what Fritz has to say. Fritz, my goodness gracious, that's a lot you had to share with us tonight. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So you really hey, feel, Rick. yeah, go ahead. You're with us. Go ahead. You're on with us. Go ahead. Speak up. You were referencing earlier about the witnesses going house to house. And if you read the book of Luke, chapter 10, verse 7, in the King James, it says, do not go house to house. In the New World Translation, it says, stay in that house. So it, it just goes part and parcel with the witnesses being in this opposite program when it comes to traditional witness, uh, traditional Christian doctrine. So I want to know Mr. Springmeyer's opinion about that, that they're being programmed in this opposite doctrine and an occult program and without knowing. Well, what's happened is, and, and I've explained this in, in my books, I've explained it in, in, uh, many other programs, um, not just six screens, I've explained that the Illuminati created, through their bloodlines, they created the LDS Mormon Church, and they created the Jehovah's Witnesses. And in order for those religions that they created to have merit with the public, they had to offer something new, you know? And so the... Watchtower Society has to present something different than what other Christians are doing. And the Mormons have to present something that's different. So both the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses go out and send their missionaries two by two. Um, they both do. And it's, it's, it's part and parcel of 
the uh, the Illuminati designs that they would create religions that that flew in the flew in the kind of get those words to come out that were different than Christianity, so that they they had appeal. And that would be the mind control aspect of the Masonry school of scoundrels, where Mormonism started from Joseph Smith. He called himself the new prophet Mohammed. You see the polygamy in Mormonism, and you see that they have this uh, this this tweet doctrine. The Catholics have the uh, they do the upside down cross over themselves. If you if you do that cross that they do over yourself, you will find yourself touching the middle of your forehead, the middle of your chest, and then crossing across your chest. That's an upside down cross that they do, and that seems to be ritualistic. The witnesses have. Oh yeah, there's dogs. a lot of pre. There's a lot of Freemasonry and Mormonism, including on their magic underwear that they're never allowed to take off. Right. They have a little square and compass on it. Does Mitt Romney wear that every day, you think? <laughs> I don't know what Mitt Romney, Romney does. Okay. I'm because just, he's actually you know, from a breakaway group that went to Mexico so they could continue doing uh, polygamy. But and that just to, polygamy me? would be, would polygamy be what Solomon, like Solomonic witchcraft, would, would Solomon add the many wives? That he that his occultic uh, his under well, like the, if you look at the what's the six hundred and sixty sixth uh, book of the scriptures is in Solomonic uh, it's in Solomon's books right yeah I couldn't tell you what that verse is um, but yes you were, you're correct. Solomon was a polygamist. I mean, so were a lot of the patriarchs. Um, but polygamy got Solomon. He was the wisest man in the world, and then he became the wisest magician and totally became, to right. use the Jehovah's Witness term, apostate. He fell away from God. Um, because, and and his, his wives were the respons responsible for him falling away from God. So yeah, he had a well, he was the son of a Hittite, wasn't he? If if Bathsheba was his mother, and mm -hmm. David right. took Uriah the Hittite's wife from right. Uriah, then it would right. be more than likely that Bathsheba was a Hittite, and there is mm -hmm. a uh, a rift there, and that sure. the witnesses because. They deny the Godhead. They are like Noahide, essentially. So they fit right into the New World Order system, which yeah. prohibits um, idolatry when the Orthodox Jews worship Yeshiva. They worship Shiva. That's what Yeshiva comes from. And when they go to the uh, Yeshivas, they are taught a taught uh, Hinduism mixture for astral projection. They wear the black and white outfits all the time, like Harry Potter. Like Harry Potter was sent to Hogwarts to learn spells. So that's mm. what a Yeshiva is, who Shiva worship. And they also practice Allah worship. Because if you think of Israel in your head right now, you're going to see an image of the Dome of the Rock because they do incorporate Allah worship. That's why the Saudis have all the money in the world. They seem to be consigliere to this whole system where they're put in charge of it. But through the petrol dollar system, we as a Western nation, we're a golem. And we are just pil they're pilfering our finances, our blood, and our treasure, and feeding the Eastern nations with our technologies, our manufacturing. They're moving it out of the way so that they can have their way with us. 
and the world will just move on without it. Well, uh, I don't know that I would totally uh, line up with what you're saying. I mean, uh, Islam and, and Judaism, even even being practiced by Kabbalists, is, is different than Islam. And um, But the, each of these things are, it's all like the Pharisees. The Pharisees practice Satanism in secret. So there's a there's a hidden side to a lot of these people. Um, but so on the surface, Acts 742, pardon me? In, in Acts 742, it talks about Israel being handed over, given over to the worship of the host of heaven, which would be second heaven worship, mm-hmm. which is what the Shiva, the Yeshiva would, would entail. And in mm-hmm. Jeremiah 8, Verse 1 in the King James, it speaks about an evil family that is worshiping the sun, the moon, and the stars, Mm -hmm. and that they will be dealt with after they are returned to Israel. If you read Jeremiah 8 1 in the King James, and it seems that there is this Masonic corporation incorporation into it with our country being dragged into it as uh, just mind control, like you said. But when it comes to the witnesses and the, the Noahide law, because they don't have that Godhead concept, that they are being tricked into it systematically. And did you hear about the radionic boxes? I wanted to know if you heard about radionic boxes. Yeah, I'm familiar with the radionic boxes. Well, the, the, the danger for the, the Jehovah's Witnesses is going back to something I said earlier. They're handed this box of truth, and they don't, they don't think for themselves or look outside the box. So it's like if they could think for themselves and, and explore things on their own, They'd be wondering, well, who is the Antichrist, and is the system that's coming uh, coming down the line is it an Antichrist system? And what, the, what you know, they'd be asking all kinds of questions. But instead, they just simply sit there and are spoon fed whatever the Watchtower Society wants to spoon feed them, which is just baby baby food, really. Um, and so, yeah, they're yeah. they're not they're not prepared to understand the nuances of what's going on in the Middle East. And about the radionic boxes, there's a guy on YouTube. His name is J S Garrett, G A R R E T T, and he has a lot of videos on radionics. And okay. I wanted to ask you, Mr. Springmeyer, if you heard from Vincent Bruno, because he was referencing a lot of your work in terms oh, really? of the there's a lot of people that you, there's a lot of people that use my work a lot of people that use my work and don't even know where it came from um yeah. no i'm not uh, no i haven't uh communicated with bruno well i'm glad that he's getting some use out of my my material um but there's you know coming on this show and, and i'll say this to rick and the rest of you listeners, right now I have easily a couple dozen radio hosts that would want me to come on and have been ha- have asked me before Rick even. And um, I have just turned everybody down because I was exceptionally busy. And Rick just happened to have gotten my wife's blessing. My wife recently, she said, you got to go on Rick's show. And I was like, well, we talked about it. When when Rick asked me to come on this show uh, a few days ago, and I talked with my wife, you know, she was like, you got too much on your plate. And I was like, yeah, I really do. I have too much on my plate to, to take away from, to take time away from Rick. Um, but, she, but then she turned around and said, you know, you should go on Rick's show. So, um, 
I'm glad you came yeah. by. We really appreciate picking your brain because we know that you are <laughs> a treasure, sir. So uh, the audience you know, like this government is a, de- a it's a democratic Machu Picchu. That's what I see America as being. The flagpole is the barbershop pole of old. It's a surgeon's pole. And um, the Star of David is on the dollar bill for a reason. It's a sigil. We're on Event Horizon. Don't watch that movie. Yeah. I I hear what you're saying. I just want to add my comment that I I want people to get away from uh, thinking that one particular group, that evil resides with one particular group of people out there and they they put a label uh, you know and say this group is the enemy or that group you know it, it's like the scripture says for all of sin you know and we we need to look at ourselves and and get ourselves right with God and just realize that evil can lurk in anybody's heart. And, um, and, and you can't put a label to this. In fact, these people are so sneaky that, that, you know, I, I, I commonly out there on my talks, I would say, what do you think is the most popular occupation for Illuminati Kingpin? It's being a Christian minister. You know, mm. um, but yeah, I hear exactly what you're saying, and and there's a, you know, the the Pharisees and the, and the people descended from the Pharisees, uh, they're the ones that killed Christ, and they're a very dangerous group, and um, uh, you know that's that's the way it is, um. Uh, but it's, it's more complicated. The, the Pentagon is shaped like a pentagram, you know? It's right there in your face, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, may I? And Hello. You, ever, you ever hear of a ley line and ley line 188 being where Sandy Hook Elementary was? And there was a Masonic Lodge across the way from Sandy Hook. And they took that building down. And they use these ley lines to charge. They use tragedies along ley line networks. And you can just web search ley line, L-E-Y-L-I-N-E, ley line 188. And you'll see that all of these points, Sandy Hook, uh, JFK, Dealey Plaza was an open air Masonic temple plaza. Mm -hmm. And it was shaped in a trident which is the marine kingdom which is the realm of satan and the cladding on the old world trade center towers was cladded with trident and that was also a ritual sacrifice jfk was a ritual sacrifice of the killing of the king ritual Mm -hmm. and you got rfk running RFK seems to be a uh, Kabbalah Manchurian candidate, a mixture of Sahan Sahan and um, RFK. Mm-hmm. To be honest, yeah. but I really appreciate your work. I really appreciate you got appreciate you guys. You and Rick have a great night. Thank you. Hi, Fritz. Hi. Hi. Um, I had a question. I really enjoyed your program. How do the things that <clears throat> excuse me that you've been talking about line up with the UN Agenda 21? I've been reading up on that. You're asking me how are we lining up with it? Yeah, the things that you're talking about, do they go hand in hand with the UN Agenda 21? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they do. They're hitting us from a whole bunch of different angles and um, with so much so many agendas and so much going on around us. It's like uh, just one one of these things would be horrible enough, but but that they that they've got multiple multiple ones, and um, you know they want to take us into these large sustainable cities, depopulate the countryside. Um, they they'd like uh, 
cars to be self-driving, um, you know, and on and on. Yeah, so th they have been a little bit slow in getting their United Nations agendas done, but they're still trying to push them, you know. And that's all. United Nations, if you go back and, and look who started it and everything, I mean, look at, at the original land that was donated to the United Nations. It was donated by the rock by Rockefeller. Um, <laughs> and, and then in my Be Wise of Serpents book, I talk, that was clear back in 1991. I, in my Be Wise of Serpents book, I was already exposing World Health Organization and and the dirty people that were running it. So I, I was already, what's the word? I was already concerned about who were back then. <laughs> it was, I didn't have to wait until the, the uh, pandemic to uh, be concerned about who. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I knew long before the pandemic there was things going on, but kind of brought it to a head with that. <clears throat> so how is it you know all these things? And you manage not to live in fear. <laughs> I don't live in fear. I don't live in fear. I, I choose not to, but how is it that you manage? You know a lot more than I do. Well, it goes back to my faith, you know, and I think that that's why, you know, it's, it's really hard for most people to understand where I'm coming from because I, where I'm coming from is I, totally sold out to Yeshua, totally sold out to Christ. Um, and uh, he, he's my all in all. And um, the, well, it, it, it also, I'll, I'll tell you something. It goes back, uh, it, it'll make more sense if I tell more of the story. I was a West Pointer, United States Military Academy. Mm -hmm. And they taught me total obedience, total instant obedience. And when I resigned West Point as a conscientious subjector before my second year was up, I told myself I was going to take the one lesson that the military taught me very well, which was total instant obedience, and I was going to apply it to God. And I reread the scriptures, and the, the whole book's a different book if you have the attitude I'm going to do what God wants you to do. And one of the things that's repeated in the scriptures many, many times is fear not, be of good courage, you know, and, you know, basically Christ is saying, I've got your backside. It's going to work out. All things work together for them who love God and are called according to his purpose. And if you just, if you're, my life is Christ, and Christ Christ builds that into you, and um, you know it's it just it, 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 either way I win. If I follow God now, if I follow Yahuwah, and like like He asked me, I win. If I'm martyred, I still win. I just get a promotion quicker, you know. So it's just I, I don't know with that. You know, when I was exposing the trauma-based mind control, I really didn't know from one day to the next if I would be alive, you know. But I knew that God had called me to do that, and I just took it a day at a time and, and left everything in his hand. Um, that that explains it, you know. And, and it's not that I have an easy time, you know. Uh, the job I had before this one, um, the human relations, uh, director found out who I was and he said, you know, you have a choice of quitting or being fired. Um, so, you know, it's, you have to pay a price, but, um, that's, it's not a, it's, if you love Christ and, and he's your all in all, it's not a problem. I don't know how to explain that. I mean, it's just. You know, I, I have Christ. He's also He's my sufficiency, and so I, I I'm not worried. He He provides for me. So if I lose a job, I have faith that He's provides for me. Um, I don't know. And that that hopefully that helps answer it. 
Well, it kind of does. I'm a, I'm a former Jehovah's Witness, so, you know, I, I understand the faith-based thing. However, I don't know what I believe at this point. I know what I don't believe, but I'm not sure what I do believe. So, uh, <laughs> but I do want to see where you're coming from on that. Yeah, yeah. Well, well see, it's a different approach than Jehovah's Witnesses. See, oh, I I'm, on a, I'm on a spiritual journey, and I want to learn from God. They're not on a spiritual journey. They're just being spoon-fed from this organization that says they're essentially God. You know, we're right. God's channel of communication. So it's a totally different thing. I mean, they have been totally stifled. And if you are if you're allowed to grow, it, it's amazing what God can do with you. Okay. I like that thought. All right. Well, thank you very much for answering my question. Well, thank you very much for coming on and, and sharing and talking. Okay. Well, I hope to hear from you again in the future. Well, thank you. This is Springmeyer. Yes. Hello. I just had a quick question. Uh, you were talking about how uh, the powers that be will take our money, um, our investments. Um, you don't have money, then your, your property will be lost. What is your recommendation for how you can try to protect your assets? Should you not hold on to stocks? Um, should you not hold on to property or buy property in countries where they don't have a property tax? You know, are there other countries that are going to have a better outcome? What, what, what is your take on that? <laughs> I definitely would not own stock. After my show today, I would hope that people realize that that is a good way to lose your money. Security, stocks, and bonds, not a good idea. Land, if you've got your land paid for or have a means to pay it off, yeah, by all means, have some land. Um, but if, if, you're, if you're head in, in, if you're in over your head with debt, uh, you've got to really seriously take into consideration when we go into a deflationary period, how are you going to pay that land off? You know, how are you going to pay your property tax? So land is good. I would, what I would like to see, and I prayed about this back in 1990. I said, Lord, what is the answer to this world order? You know? Show me. And and the answer that I was shown was, is that the body of Christ should function as the body of Christ was meant to function, you know, which we don't. You look at the churches, they're just an aggregation of individuals. You know, on Sunday, this aggregation of individuals gathers together, and then they go their separate ways for the rest of the week. They're not in community. You know, but then when I tell Christians, well, the answer is Christian community. Then they start thinking Jim Jones and they're afraid, you know, but I'm not talking about Jim Jones community. I'm talking about being intentional neighbors that are in fellowship and being built up in love. It's, it's, uh, it's a concept that's so strange to mainstream Christians. They don't even know what I'm talking about, but there are answers out there, but we need to, we need to, Think ourselves into the spirit of God and see where he's leading us and go into fellowship and intense fellowship uh, with very uh, strong other Christians. And I've experienced this, but it's hard to, it's hard to convey in just a couple words that what Christendom or the churches is experiencing is really just a surface version of what God has for us, you know. And that would make a big difference because if we have a community of sold out individuals, we'll be able to help each other. Anyway, uh, that was kind of a long-winded answer to a short question. But well, let me just let me just ask one question to get a specific answer. Would you recommend buying land or property in countries that do not have a property tax? So 
so that you don't have the issue, well, theoretically, you don't have the issue of the de-inflation. You wind up losing your property because you just can't pay the property tax. Now, obviously, that could change. Um, yeah, well, time, yeah, I think that. that there will be. Yeah, I think that there will be uh, some places that are are safer. I mean, uh, Heavenly Father has shown that, and there's places of refuge around the world already being established. And yes, um, if if the Lord, you know, I use the word Lord, Yeshua Christ, however you want to put a term a name to it. To him, um, if you're being led, and and you know you're being led, then go for it. the The thing is, is we have to be careful not to do it in our own power. You know, um, if God's behind it, you know it, it's going to be blessed. But if we're doing it with our, in our own power, it, it's probably in some way uh, not going to excel. So, um, okay. Thank that's you. Prerequisite. Okay. Thanks. Okay. How are we doing out there, people? Hello. 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 Hi, Mister. Uh, my, I, I apologize, uh, Fritz. I can't uh, remember your last name well, but I mean not respect. Thank you so much for your work. Uh, I think you're a really good researcher. I wanted to ask you uh, your opinion about the American experiment and how much it has changed. I used to live in the U.S. Um, 10 years ago, and uh, 20 years ago, actually, and it was a beautiful place. Everybody was getting along and uh, full of uh, fun things to do, and everybody was kind and helpful. And 20 years ago, I came, uh, and then I came back a couple of years back, and everything has changed. What is going <laughs> on? What's your opinion? <laughs> Thank you. You're, 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 you're right. I've been discussing that with some people this last week. Basically, I've been telling people, you know, this country is going down the toilet and we're circling the drain. Um, yeah, I, I've sit here and watched this um, for, you know, uh, I was born in 1955, so I have a, a some perspective on this. And, uh, yeah, I can, I've watched since, since I was young this decline in the United States, and it just keeps getting worse and declining worse. And now this younger generation basically is a lost generation. And, um, oh yeah, I, I, I could say, but you, you've seen it. So I don't want to go into all these negatives. It's sad. It's sad that it destroyed this country and it was intentional. The United States was their biggest threat because the Americans were free and they were intelligent and they were mobile. And they intentionally set out to destroy the United States. And they've done a good job. But they're not finished. They've got some more nasty stuff planned for us. But, yeah, it, it's and, – and God's allowed it because we have earned judgment, too. So it's not like we don't have ourselves to blame. I mean, we, we can point the finger, but what we need to do is each one of us realize that if we're pointing the finger, we got – four fingers pointing back at ourselves, we all share some responsibility for the decline in this country. And it's sad. And you're right. You you can see it. Ten years difference, you you notice a marked difference. That's true. Uh, that's true. And, and uh, yeah, thanks for sharing that. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Bye. <clears throat> okay. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um. My name's Kim. Um, I love all your books. I'm reading the Worldwide Evil, I can't remember, 13 Blood Lives. I don't know. I forgot. But I, um, okay. I'm reading that one right now. I'm about halfway through it, and I'm very much enjoying it. And I've got several others, the, um, the two, the mind control ones. I have to take those slowly because they are very deep. 
also <laughs> read the one with um, Cisco Wheeler, the the white horse. I can't remember what it's called, but yeah, I've read okay. a lot of your stuff and love it. And wow. um, uh, all of a sudden, I'm forgetting what I was going to say. Oh, one thing I was going to say about just what is going on and everything, and uh, the way a lot of people seem to be, as you call it, asleep. And I get all upset about that. But one thing I was thinking about some of them being asleep, in a way they're keeping the joy going. <laughs> so I kind of wonder, like my kids and stuff, and they're pretty asleep. <laughs> and so it's hard, but they they have the love of life, you know. And I think about, not that I don't want to, them to, figure things out but I like that they still have a dream and you know in some ways I think maybe I pray about that a lot and I wonder is God trying is God helping things stay at least alive so that we don't lose hope because like if I I look on let's say Instagram or something not that I go on those a lot I see little tiny children playing a piano tiny tiny children playing guitar, <laughs> things like that. And so that kind of gives me a little bit of a um, positive feeling about it. But I do try to, um, you know, bring awareness to things such as the uh, WHO and the amendments and the fact that they're taking away, like, human rights or or at least they, they crossed it out about human rights, so it's worrisome to me. And what do you think about the that situation, about the one health situation that they want to bring in and different things like that? Like, do you see any way of how anyone could resist? Is, is there, I mean, should anyone even try to resist, I wonder, or should we... Not that, not to, I'm not saying take the mark of the beast if there is one. That's what I do think there is going to be one. Um, but do, what would someone do that's um, still having faith, do you think, in God, but, and not doing it in their own power? As you know, how you were saying in a way, um, not relying on yourself, but having faith in God, um, but yet doing something proactive to not, you know, give into this new system they're trying to bring in. If that's, it, I don't know if you think that's happening. I kind of do. And I don't think it's the same as what the Watchtower thinks. I think they're trying to imitate the Bible one. <laughs> and yeah. maybe it is really coming in, but I think they are, they are doing, they're trying to do their narrative, you know? Mm-hmm. So anyway, I, what do you think about like how a person, should I, um, with the community, okay, yes, like you said, par- pardon me? Let him answer. Oh, I apologize. <laughs> well, I you asked several him. questions. But yeah, um, you know, I was enjoying listening to you. Um, I was trying to explain it so you could know what I'm getting at. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, one of, you know, the, the good Lord asked me to do three things, you know, one was expose evil, which I've done today. Um, but the, but the other two was call people back to the word of God and give hope without hope. We're not going to move forward. So, you know, it's senseless to hear this kind of information. If we don't have the spiritual roots to go forward and hope, because otherwise people just, you know, hunker down, they go, well, we can't do anything about it. You know, why Why even think about it? Um, it's really neither, what, what the world does um, to some degree is neither here nor there because the world's going to be the world, but we need to be the kind of person that Yahweh or Jehovah, or however you want to call them, we, we need to be the person that he wants us to be. You know, we need to be in him, and we need to be Christ-like. And then l- let the chips fall where they fall, you know? I mean, it's just, he, he just, he was just quite frank about it. Yeshua was quite frank. He said, you know, if they tortured me, if they persecuted me, they're going to do the same to you, you know? 
And so I don't know why people expect anything different. Um, so, you know, that it's neither here nor there. The thing is, what they do is neither here nor there. We can't really stop them from being their mean, nasty selves. But we can make ourselves to be the person that God wants us to be. And that's really an important focus. And he wants us to have hope. And he, he, yeah, some of these things can actually become a distraction. Like you say, you know, if people lose their hope because they're looking at it. And that, that concerns me some. And it, it's, there's so much to say. Um, you know, and, and if I don't expose the evil, nobody else is, you know, the things I said tonight, I don't think you're going to hear them anywhere else. Really, seriously. Uh, I, I don't know anybody else that's telling me. That. Well, I mean, on, on the, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think anybody's going to break down to you how they have, how they know how to create these thought control religions. Um, I, I don't think, uh, anybody's going to break down to you how they have worked hard globally to steal all the stocks and bonds the, or, or, and there are a few people out there that are, are actually on track that are saying they're going to use deflation to do this. But, um, so yeah, it, it's a little lopsided on my message tonight because uh, I'm 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 exposing evil, but uh, definitely part of my job responsibility is to give people hope. And if if you don't have that, maybe this this kind of information isn't for people. You know, if if a person doesn't have that kind of hope and going forward, it it, it is going to be. Um, uh, Paralyzing. It's going to be like the person's going to be like a, a deer in headlights, you know, just frozen. And that's not going to help any. That's not going to help any. So I understand what you're saying is that people that are are ignorant of this are still going forward with their lives. You know, back in the 90s, people were, were saying, well, you know, the New World Order is coming, blah, blah, we better not have children. And I was like, no, no, don't do this. No, Christ wants us to live a life. Go ahead and have children. You know, he says, be fruitful and multiply, you know, and, and uh, continue being the person that he wants you to be. Don't, don't become paralyzed like a deer in the headlight. Yeah, thank you, because that's what I was thinking. I, I think we need to learn certain things so that we can also make wise choices. That's why I appreciate so much what you've taught because sometimes you do want to just kind of hide and say, oh, no, 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 that's not what's going on, and be in denial, and, and sometimes you need to actually know, but at the same time, I do also feel the thing about, you know, putting your faith in Christ and trying to live, uh, you know, the way he wants you to live, and so that's what I'm trying to do, too. <laughs> So, right thank you so much, and I do so appreciate you talking to us. So I'll uh, stop you. talking now, but thank you so much. Well, I, 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 I thank you in return. Yeah, hey, Rich. Yeah. Hey, uh, this is Michael. I, I'm, I'm in the building business, and well, I was. I'm retired. I'm here in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, I still keep contact with everything. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you fine. Okay. I still keep contact with all the builders and all the construction places go. What we have here in Columbus is a bunch of warehouses going up. And I keep saying to the people that I said, those, those warehouses are building, they're going to be for us. Uh, and when you talk about how they're going to collapse in a lot of homeless uh, situations, one, my question is one, do you notice the same thing in your area? And two, do you actually think that is they're building these places for, for shelters or for homeless people? Um, well, one thing I, I know that they built some FEMA camps that the barbed wire points inward, so they're going to be more like prisons, but um, that's one place that people are going to go. Um, and as, as uh, 
a lot of people are probably aware of already, all of these Walmarts have been constructed with the dual purpose that if they need to use them as detention centers when they round people up, all they have to do is take out the, the aisles and they have a huge building for for everywhere because Walmarts are everywhere. So the Walmarts are already earmarked to be uh, way stations to moving people. And where they're going to move them to, uh, I think that there's going to be different camps and different, different, uh, or there's diff- different places for different people. <laughs> yeah, I, guess, I, I believe that. Yeah. Now, now do you have, uh, what part of, what part do you live in? What part of the United States? I live in the Midwest. Okay. Do you notice a lot of warehouses going up in your area? No. Um, no. In my area, no. Okay. I, I have five going right around me right now. And you go to each part of the north, south, east, west, and mm-hmm. uh, they're being built all over. Mm-hmm. But, now I will say Columbus is the I, I think it was noted as being one of the hottest markets right now because we have Intel coming in and we have a lot of different uh, corporations coming in. But mm-hmm. I mean to have all these warehouses uh, uh, mm-hmm. it's just very unusual for me to see all this. Mm-hmm. Like I said, I've been in the building business all my life. I've never seen nothing like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, well, good looking. I'm. I'm glad that people are seeing these kind of things. Yeah, yeah. So, well, it was nice talking to you. Yeah, hey, thank you. Hi, Fritz. Yeah. Yeah, hi, Fritz. It's Tim um, from Australia. I've talked to you once before. Um, I don't have a lot to add as far as I'm pretty much on the same page as you with everything. Um, you know, like, there's always going to be slight things people disagree on. Um, no, I'd just more giving you a commendation because, like, in a nutshell, obviously where you're coming from is not to fear monger with people but to just give them a warning, you know, a heads up as to, you know, what possibly to expect in the future, um, you know, and also to have a face, you know, and so... Um, and that's kind of pretty much what I think myself. It's like the lady before talking about being a bit scared. Um, I suppose Jesus did say, when you see these things going to occur, to raise yourself to wreck, you know, so we on the alternative. They use it as a source of fear-mongering, and then they point us away from what's going on in the world, like by telling us not to get involved in political, which is pretty bad advice because you have to be involved. Well, uh, you have to watch what's going on so you can you can see what's going on in the world. Um, that's my opinion, and they also keep people away from so-called conspiracy theories, um, which I hate that but label. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, it just makes people skeptical. A lot of things aren't conspiracy theory if they're open, open facts. Yeah, it's kind of funny. The XJ, XJW witness community. It, it also separates into right being um but Rick's channel seems to have a bit more conservative side. And you you actually you actually were singled out with some heavy criticism from our better ex witness channel. Um and so is Rick for having you on, you know, Rick's Basically, he doesn't agree with what you're taking on. You know, the whole, um, the fun influence in the witness religion is. Whereas personally, I think, do you have to agree or disagree? It's like why criticise someone if they're giving them information? I, I prefer to take everything with an open mind, and you don't have to agree. Like that doesn't. Even if I don't agree, does it make you a bad person? No, you're you're coming from a place of trying to help people and you're not always going to have everything right. That's, that's my opinion. I wish more people look at it that way rather than being so critical, you know, of, um, you know, of riches to some nut job when it's clearly not the case. And, and, and I think it's pretty encouraging to see that you 
uh, trying to point people to have faith, but just not in the religious context of witnesses, you're, you, you know, from an actual biblical perspective. So, yeah, I thought I'd just give you some encouragement there. Um, you know, I, I think that yeah, you're doing a great job, and, yeah, it's just interesting listening to you. Um, personally, I tune out on a lot of the world stuff going on. If, if I find it gets discouraging, I'll, I won't listen to it for a while, but you still have to know what to expect so it doesn't take you by surprise when it happens. Um, that's my opinion. But anyway, thanks, Fritz, and I'll keep listening. Oh, yeah, and I, I did say in the comments, so I don't know if you're seeing the comments, there's a guy there... Um, Mikey, he asked a question he can't ring in. He's asking about the CBDCs and crypto, and I'm, I'm assuming he wants some advice. What were your thoughts on that? So, I'll leave it. Thanks, Rich. Okay, thanks for your sharing your perspective on things. Um, a lot of companies that are banks have gone over to uh, CBDCs. You know, they're doing trial work. I don't know if you're aware of that. Um, yeah, we're like Bank of America and a lot of other big places are, uh, they're already, they're already selling us out. Um, and, uh, there's a lot involved with the CBDCs. I've done a number of programs on them. Um, because, uh, well, you know, like there's a, there's 110 already, um, involved banks that are already involved with the pilot program of the CBDCs and, um, the new currency will be hosted with uh, major cloud providers like Microsoft and Google and Amazon. So, you know, it, it's um, BlackRock, Vanguard, these are Illuminati companies, you know, and, and um, they're totally behind all of this. Um, so, they, they've passed the the Biden administration has passed uh, legislation uh, taking us towards a CBDC, and um, so we we'll just have to wait and see when they do a recall on the, on the dollar. You know, um, Uh, like for for instance, you know the 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 Fed's governor, Gail Bannard, she, she wants a quote from her. You know, she said that she can't wrap her head around how other major countries are having digital currencies and we don't have it. You know, <laughs> and they're going to start uh, telling us, you know, that that. that uh, a digital CBDC will preserve our status as the world's reserve currency. You know, they've got all of these these nice little uh, things that they claim it's going to help us with. So it's just it's just uh, to, to make the pill shaped easier to shove down our throat. We got another person there that's got a question or comment. Uh, go ahead, hit star six, and come on, say hello to Fritz. Well, Fritz, that's amazing. It's just uh, unbelievable. I mean, I mean, how much time do you spend on this every day? <laughs> actually, not a whole lot. I, I, uh, most of my time is actually spent trying to provide for my family. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's one reason why I, I. I I am so limited in getting getting time to do radio shows is uh you know i I have some projects I'm working on on the side that i i'm investigate i I'm not even gonna say what I'm investigating, but it's an aspect of the world order that I'm investigating and so there are some 
niches that um, I'm I'm actively trying to um, pursue. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff that I just have to let go that I just don't have the time to do. Um, you know, like for you know, like just talking about the kind of things that are going on. All these companies and all of these people are leaving California, you know. Of course, it, it, it's called an exodus, but in reality, only 1% to 2% of Californians have moved out of California. But I've met some of the Californians that have moved, you know, and they don't want to live in, in what's happening in California. You know, but that's just one I just bring that up as as just one thing of a hundred that are happening right now in our country, you know, and who has the time to track it all? And um, it, it's enormous. They, they, they're just, they're shoving so much stuff. Um, they're moving so many agendas. It's really hard to, to stay on top of it. And that's and, and so I, I also have to to uh, listen to other researchers because um, I can't do it all myself. Wow, well, you're on six screens. We have some people that just called in. If you'd like to come in, six zero three. Do you want to come back and say hello to us? Uh, we've got Fritz Springmeyer. He's on with us tonight. Go ahead, six zero three. You're on with us. Go ahead. Hi, Fritz. Kevin in New Hampshire. Um, some other interesting stuff. Uh, I was looking up your your books on Amazon. There's like five there. Um, I want to ask uh, the the first three volumes you have in uh, print and uh, Kindle. Will you consider doing like an audible for your books? Um, I think some people have have done um, audio books of, of my books. They're somewhere out there. People have told me that they've found, um, you know, one of the things that's happened with, and I quit resisting this years ago, is a lot of my books have been pilfered and um, other people have printed them. Other people made money off of them. But, um, you know, it, it's a good thing. The information's getting out there. So there are there are um, digital versions of the books. You know, some people have gotten um, my Be Wise Assistance book in um, digital form, and some people have gotten it in auditory form. So there are, are there are versions out there. I don't know where they are because I didn't create them. Um, so and a of googling it. Um, pardon me. Is it just a matter of googling it? Find out who has a digital version. Yeah, yeah. It, it, if if that's important for you to find, um, you'll find it out there. And you know, of course, I like people to to buy the books from me, but. I have such a problem with producing enough books to meet book orders that, you know, and, and I want the information out there. I, I didn't write the books for myself. I wrote them to get the information out. So, yeah, if if you can find something out there, power to you. All right. Well, I prefer to just buy it from you uh, on Amazon. Are you talking about me buying it from you directly? You. Yeah, you can do that. My my website is pintracks.com. The Bloodlines of the Illuminati book is available through pintracks.com. The other books, and one would have to just send me a donation through PayPal and, and make it clear to me that what you wanted to get. And my my uh, email, if people want my email um, to write or order or whatever, my email is springmeyermessages at hotmail.com. And Springmeyer, my name is spelled S P R I N G M E I E R 
in the messages. It's all lowercase, one word, Springmeyer messages at hotmail.com. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, yeah. The only other question I had was you had one book on Amazon, it was like pretty expensive, almost $200. That's kind well, of deep. none of my books that are being sold for me that high. I mean, people are, are thinking my books and making a lot of money off of them. Years ago, oh. I, I came out with a, a book, The Watchtower and the Masons. Right? I sold The Watchtower and Masons for $10. I think part of the time I so, later sold it for $12, $12, right? People actually... Yeah. Someone actually told me they paid six hundred dollars for that book, The Watchtower and the Mason. Wow. Okay. So if I and were that, buy that book, that book is kind of interesting too. I was just telling someone this last week how because they were asking me questions and I said, you know, if you wrote a, a book associating the the Indians, the American Indians with the Masons. They wouldn't care. He wrote a book about uh, big politicians that were associated with Freemasons. They wouldn't care. You know, there's even a book written by a Freemason about the clergy and Freemasonry, you know. But when I wrote this book about the Watchtower being associated with the Freemasons, they came unglued. And, and, and so my question is, is why did it upset Freemasons? Why are they upset that somebody would expose that there's a connection between the Jehovah's Witnesses and Freemasons? Why? Maybe because it's part of the secret agenda? <laughs> well, they, they are connected. They are connected. Russell was a Freemason. And yeah. his, his grave, they have a pyramid. And the Freemason uh, thing there is right across the street. Uh, yeah. Building this, that all belongs to it's a Freemason. I don't know what it is, a temple or what it is. It's right across the street from the cemetery. Yeah. Yeah, it's a Masonic timber cemetery. Yeah, yeah, I think it is. Yes. Yeah. The connections there. The um. So if I buy any of the books on Amazon, you're not benefiting from those. No, um, they might not even be my my version. They might be uh, printed by somebody else. Oh. I know my wife bought something off of Amazon and years before we got married, and then she was disappointed that it uh, it it only had half of the book. It wasn't the full book. All right. I'll go on the website. Yeah. Um, my other question is um, about your faith. Uh, since I don't, I haven't gone to the kingdom hall in like 12 years. And, uh, you know, when you leave that kind of religion, you're kind of disillusioned. And I know some people that are born again Christians. Is this the same kind of faith that you have? A born again Christian? Can you ask that again? Because you were kind of breaking up. Or let me see if I, I, you're asking me, am I a born again Christian? Yes. Yes, I was born, you know, uh, Rick refers to me as having been a Jehovah's Witness, but I, when, when, when I started attending the Kingdom Hall, I was already a born-again Christian, and I never got baptized into the Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, I, I investigated them. I took a book study with um, the presiding overseer, but... I never joined the Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, I did attend the Kingdom Hall, and so I know them intimately from having rubbed shoulders with them for a couple years. And I had an adopted brother that was uh, um, worked at Bethel. Um, so, yeah, I, I definitely have associated with uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. But I never was a baptized Jehovah's Witness. I was a uh, I was a born again Christian even then when I was, and that was one reason why they didn't appeal to me is I already knew what the Spirit of God could do in my life, and I knew I was born again, and I knew that I'd had an anointing, 
So why would I want to give all of that up? You know, they they're not offering anything. Why would I why would I want to throw away my faith in Christ and the anointing and, and all the rest of that for we told that you're of the great crowd and the Bible wasn't written to you. Yeah, well that 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 doesn't appeal to me. <laughs> okay. I uh, just I went to one meeting uh at a Epson Bible church with a a man who's a born again Christian and it just after being out for years with the Jehovah's Witnesses and uh, going to the kingdom all is just total different thinking for me. Maybe there's a lot some of their mind control get into my head. I don't know. But it's just different and trying to understand what this born again Christian thing is, that's all. Yeah. Well Christ in John three said you need to be born again. And um yes. it's something that God does to you, you don't do it. When I when I got born again, it was something that God did to me or, or with me. It wasn't I it wasn't like I just come along and say, Well, I'm gonna be born again today, you know. It didn't work that way. In fact I tried to come to, to to church and to Christ on my own and I couldn't do it. it God had to do it. I had to be you know, I had I, I admitted to God that I was a sinner, um, and that opened God, that opened my life up for for uh, Yahweh Jehovah to come in and start working in my life was to confess that I was a sinner, which is not that hard. It shouldn't be hard for anybody. You know, I mean, everybody should recognize that they're a sinner. <laughs> That's not that big of a deal to re- recognize that. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Fritz. Appreciate it. What was your What was the uh, website? Your website again? Um, Intracks dot com. Well, hold on one second here, folks. We just got uh, the phone call got shut off here. We'll be right back on with you, so stay with us. Don't go anywhere. Fritz will be right back with us every once in a while. The phone call does go off after about. Welcome into the live six screen conference call. We thank you for joining in. To speak up and talk, press star six on your telephone. When you are done talking, press star six to mute yourself. Remember, when you are unmuted, your phone is a microphone and picks up on all noises in the background. We hope you enjoy the programs tonight. You will now be placed into the conference. If you are the host, press star now. Why? Please enter your PIN followed by. Thank you. There are Hold 11 participants folks. in the conference. Right Recording did not us. start because your yes, storage is full. Please log there. in and delete right recordings or purchase more storage from your account. While we're sharing it, and then I'll, I'll listen to what they have to say. What's hard is there's so much out there, it's hard to know who to trust. <laughs> well, that's a good point. And let me just say this. Um, I discovered from from the get-go that most of the people out there in that are that are out there supposedly exposing the world order are actually controlled opposition or not sincere. So yeah, it, it it's pretty difficult, and um, you you can see the evidence for that because when they uh, in the late nineties everybody started warning about Y two K, you know, the world's going to end in with Y two K, and I was very suspicious about that. Um, that's just an, a good example of how. There's a lot of controlled opposition. And if you're not careful, you begin to look foolish because you'll you'll be 
repeating what someone said and it, it, it's just going to, you're going to end up with egg on your face to non-believers. Yeah, so. Well, that's, that's why it's so hard because not, not, we don't all have your brain and your, your, um, your good way of researching. And so it makes it difficult. And that's why we enjoy having you on the sixth screen so much. It's because we know we can trust what you say. Your research is sound. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you. I had a question, Mrs. Freemeyer. Do you have any um, thoughts on the modern day connection between the papacy and Freemasonry? You're interested in that, that connection? So back early on, I think it was 1992 when I originally came out with the list, but uh, I think I updated it in 93, it's been a lot of years, but I came out with the list of 200 top Vatican officials that were Freemasons, and I gave their initiation dates, their secret Masonic names, um, sometimes what lodges they were in. Um, and nobody was interested in it. So um, I was surprised, you know, I was, I was disappointed. Um, and, and here, here this last year, finally somebody actually asked me for the list. <laughs> but um, the actual longest list is buried somewhere in my boxes of research. But I was able to pull out. Um, one of oh, a shorter version of it and send it um, by email. But yeah, there's, you know, you have to understand the dialectics. And um, there was a contrived war between Freemasonry and the Vatican. But when the thing of it is, is both the Vatican and Freemasonry are, are, like the gloves to the secret hand. And the Vatican's controlled by Illuminati, so is Freemasonry. They both take their orders from the same thing. It is contrived, and I, I've gone in and explained these kind of things. And in my my Be Wise of Serpents book, I talk about how in, I think it was 1963, you started to have the Freemasons and the Knights of Columbus have joint meetings. They both get their jewelry from the same store, you know, um, same manufacturer. So <laughs> they, they, they've had joint meetings since the 60s and they're working in harmony. And um, so that, that contrived war that went on for like a hundred years is now over. So there's a lot of connections between the Vatican and Freemason. Um, Got it. Pardon me? And you know how we're discussing this right now, and I'm sure other groups and other people and all of the Internet people are discussing it. People just can feel that something unusual is happening, and I'm sure that they feel that there's unseen you know, forces that are playing hard on uh, people's lives. Is this going to result in a bloodbath? I mean, are people going to take to the street at some point in time when enough jobs are lost, um, when enough people are homeless, like you talked about, um, the homeless that we have before? I mean, at, 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 at some point, do you feel like there's going to be a breaking point where just people just all over the world, whether it's simultaneous or not, just will say, I, I've had enough, and their back is against the wall, they've got nothing to lose, they're going to take to the street. Do you foresee that? And why has that already been? Remember a few years ago, they had those World Trade Organization demonstrations. So mm -hmm. you, the answer to your question is yes, but kind of no. Yes, there will be demonstrations, but, there, but people don't understand how these kind of things become controlled. So, yeah, there'll be revolts but they will be controlled by their people. So the end result is not going to be good for our side. 
Um, yeah, it, it, it will be one way of, of squashing the opposition because they'll, their leaders will stand up and, and ride the anger of people and lead them. And yeah, there'll be, there'll be protests, but, um, it's, it's not going to be the, the grassroots rebellion that needs to go on because people don't understand how to identify all of the, I guess you could call them traitors to humanity among us. Um, a lot of people have sold out. Right. I mean, because that's kind of, that was kind of my feeling on September, not September 11th, but on the January 6th, you know, take over of the Capitol and all of that, irrespective of politics and how I feel about Donald Trump and all the rest. I was just happy to see that people felt like, hey, an election was taken from us. We're not going to take it laying down. And they took up arms and they, and they went to the Capitol. And I don't know if I sound insane saying that, but that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. Do you feel like that was any kind of a wake-up call to the powers that be that, hey, you know, these are all, not all of these people are just going to, you know, go down without a fight? Yeah, but look how, how January 6th turned out. You see what I mean? Right. And it was a disaster for some of those people. They went right. there to to defend their rights, and it turned out to be a nightmare. Yeah, that's that's a good example of what I'm talking about. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, before that kind of stuff happens, I expect will this the country will break down into some kind of civil war. That's what they're really. Yeah, that's that, that's that's exactly right. And is it? I mean, obviously, the civil war that we've had before, of course, that's been well on well taught in school, whether it's factual or not. But what do you what do you think the civil war when would just be along the lines of the half? or do you see some sort of specific, uh, you know, points for the country to take um, except to on one side or the other? Or does that remain to be seen? They're dividing the conservatives and the, and the liberals. And, you know, this country has become so polarized. You never saw it before. When I was a child, someone could be a Democrat, somebody could be a, a Republican. Big deal, you know. You know, that's your right to vote how you want. I have my right to vote. You know, there wasn't the polarization. Now, there is a deep polarization, just like there was before the Civil War. You know, earlier in our country, if you were from the South and you had slaves, eh, people in the North said, yeah, okay, well, that's his right to think that way. You know, I don't, I don't believe in slavery, but he believes it. So, hey, you know, they, they had a very uh, lukewarm attitude towards the issues. But by the time that the Civil War broke out, people's feelings were raw. And people are getting raw over some of these issues like, you know, men competing in women's sports as women. And, you know, half the children in California getting sex changes and just it, it just all this nonsense has really polarized the nation. Right. I had another thought um as, as you're talking. I was just thinking about just a few years ago, it seems like technology was the wrong front where there were a lot of jobs being created. People are encouraging other people to go into, um, you know, CIS or information science, whatever you want to call it. And now it seems like that has, that trend has just kind of stopped with all the tech companies constantly laying off. There was another tech company that laid off either yesterday or today. Um, with respect to the market, is, is that also something that's being controlled where they are 
whoever whoever it is, powers that be, are forcing the economy in, into a position where there are no jobs, um, or is that just kind of a natural part and parcel of a democratic monetary system? <laughs> no, the market is very, very controlled. It has been our whole lives. Um, no, that is one of their control mechanisms. I brought that out early on in my talks back in the 90s. No, that was what, there's, there's a number of control areas and the market is one of them. You know, the media or, or in education, that's another one, you know. There's a number of these, you know, areas where areas of control and the market is one of them. Yeah, it, no, it, things that happen in the market are not accidentally happening. There's a lot going on behind this. Wow. So it just seems like they have all the money and all the power and they can create these situations and wait everybody out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it yeah. says it has all this. Pardon me. This big reset. This big reset and all of this stuff that we're talking about now. Are we talking about potentially within our lifetime? Or are we talking a couple of generations down the road? Or what kind of time frame do you feel in your gut? Um, no, it's planned for a lifetime. Yeah, it's planned for a lifetime. Yes, it is planned for our lifetime. Okay. Wow, unreal. You know, but it's some of these things that you say that's just so true. I, I was just thinking about, about the fact that, and I'm sure you know this, Bill Gates is the largest private holder of farmland in the United States. And the first time I read this, I thought to myself, what is the software pioneer? Doing with so much private farming, what does he know that that we don't know? What does Bill Gates? Yeah, and it's just things like I'm sorry, what? You're asking what does Bill Gates know that we don't know? Well, I was just making a statement. This is what popped into my head when I read this in the paper. Why would a software pioneer go up and gobble up all the farmland in the U.S. is what I was thinking as I read this. And I was thinking to myself, what does he know that we don't know? Why is he trying to control the, the farmland? I don't know if it's farmland that's being used or the dormant. I, I have no idea, but I'm like, what does he know that we don't know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and we talk about it, it's obvious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And how is he going to use it too? Right. I mean, obviously, he's going to control food prices. I mean, to me, you need food, you need air, and you need water. You can't control air so that leaves food and water. And mm -hmm. yeah. it looks like he's trying to do at least on one front. Still there? Yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> well, go ahead. We got uh, we got Fritz Springmeyer on with us. What do you have to say? Six three zero. Hey, Rick. How you doing? Good, Mark. How, how's it going? Good, good, Mark. Thank you. Good. Good to hear. Well, it's good to hear. Yes, Rick. Well, yeah. Um, I think Fritz has a really good show. Uh, a lot of things he's covering is is really good, and I like everything he's been talking about so far. So, got a good show going, and and uh, so and Rick, you're doing like I said, one heck of a great job uh, with the six streams of Watchtower. And hey, man, I'm with you 100. percent So keep doing a great job, and uh, and continue helping other people and giving the good support to everyone. And of course, we give it the good support right back. And uh, and and overall, like I said uh, Fritz is he's doing a great job tonight. So. And thank you so very much. I do greatly appreciate it. And I appreciate you, Rick, and all of the rest of you XJWs for your good support as well. Well, thank you, Mark. Well, Fritz, I'll tell you what, we got so many people that have uh, been listening in here tonight. Boy, you're getting a real uh, sampling of what goes on. Boy, Fritz, you have got so many things to share with people. They really, really enjoy it. 
So listen, before Fritz leaves us, is there anybody else that would like to speak up and say hello to Fritz Springmeier? He's on with us tonight. He's live, so here's your chance. Go ahead. You're on with us. Well, Fritz, I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing. Well, I, this is uh, Stephanie again. I just had a quick question. Uh, did you, were you ever a fan of the work of uh, Maxwell Jordan? What did you think about some of the things he spoke of? Maxwell Jordan. Yeah, I'm familiar with with, with Maxwell Jordan. His his original na name was Russ Pine. Yeah. Um, well, they they say if you don't have something good to say about something, someone don't say anything. Um, yeah, I I don't want to get into that subject, but you know, if people. Uh, have listened to him and they got some benefit from him. Hey, power to him. He's not a Christian, and, and he, he openly said that his mentor was Manly P. Hall. Manly P. Hall was a grandmaster in the Illuminati as well as a grandmaster in Freemasonry. So uh, that tells you who, uh, by his own words, who his mentor was. And, um, you know, he comes at things from a totally different perspective from me. And he tried to, uh, he tried to basically take my ministry down for years. You know, he was, he was someone who opposed me. So I don't know, what would you like me to say about him? That That's probably enough. Uh, I yeah, that's enough. I didn't know that. Sorry to, sorry to even bring it up. <clears throat> well, Fritz, I mean, it's amazing that we uh, could get you on here tonight and talk about some of the things that are going on in the world. People really appreciate uh, what you're saying. We, we appreciate it uh, so much, Fritz. So we want to thank you very much for coming on the six screens tonight. So he's on with us thank tonight. You, Linda. If you have any thoughts for, for Spritz, uh, for Fritz, he's on with us right now. If you'd like to ask him any questions, any thoughts, if not, we're going to cut him loose and let him get back to a normal life because he's been so gracious <laughs> to come on and speak with us tonight, Fritz. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All righty, so, okay, so that's about it. Fritz, thank you very much. Yeah, for, thank you. Thank you, Fritz, for coming on tonight and wanting to be with us. We really appreciate it. Uh, you're a good man to take the time out and share some of these thoughts with us. I mean, there's a lot of people that might say, well, wow, I've learned things here tonight I never heard before. So we appreciate all the help you give us here at the Six Queens. Thank you, Fritz. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Well, thank you very much, and you have a good night yourself, Fritz, and we'll be in touch with you. Keep waving that flag of victory, and Fritz, don't you ever give in, up or out. You're a good man. Don't you ever change. We love you, buddy. Hey, love you too. Thanks. Thank Bye. you. Yeah. All right, so that's Fritz Springmeyer. Folks, we are going to have six screens tomorrow, Sunday edition. You do not want to miss it, starting at 1 p.m., Eastern Standard Time. So we're looking forward to okay. tomorrow's program. And all the people that came okay. on tonight, we want to thank you very much for coming in. Thank you for listening to the six screens. And thank you for calling into the program. So we'll see you tomorrow, you beginning at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on the six screens Telenetwork. Thank you very much. We'll see you tomorrow. And uh, we appreciate your presence here tonight. And keep waving that flag of victory. Don't you ever give in, up or out. We'll see you tomorrow, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's right. You're, not. You're on the Six Screens Telenetwork. Earning the reputation of giving all the right ingredients. Uninhibited in exposing the hard, cold facts about the Watchtower Society. <laughs> Disney.